And now we're after Christmas. We're celebrating uh, the after Christmas party, as it were. So today, that's what we want to talk about. We're concluding our series, Seeking the Savior. And in this series, we've been talking about not just the birth of Jesus Christ, but how we look for so many things in the world to satisfy our souls. We seek after other things rather than the Savior. And today, we're going to be talking about what happened after the birth of Jesus Christ. You know, a lot of energy is poured into Christmas Day, and we go shopping, we, we uh, stay up late at night wrapping gifts, uh, we clean up, and we have to go to the rubbish dump and take care of everything that was in the house. Some of you already took your Christmas tree down, and that's fine, but there's a lot of work and energy that goes into Christmas Day, and so we're all burnt out after that. We're tired. We just want to go to sleep. We just want to relax, but then there's New Year's Eve. And so on New Year's Eve, we have parties. Uh, our, family get, uh, our families get together. And, and for us, we gather together. We have our New Year's Eve party. We celebrate the New Year coming in. And then at about 2 o'clock in the morning, after you've eaten dinner, you have to clean up. But you eat dinner again at about 3 o'clock in the morning after you're done cleaning up. And then either you stay up and you're just, ah, drink a lot of coffee, or you go to sleep Get up at about 10 o'clock and clean up some more. And then because you have leftover food, you eat again. It's kind of like a breakfast, lunch, brunch kind of thing. And then you eat again. And then you're done. And then you eat lunch because you got to eat at 12, right? That's our excuse. Oh, we're hungry again. But you're really not. And then some of you go to the movies on New Year's Day. So you go to the movies, but you're full, but somehow you can still eat popcorn and mochi crunch and candies and sodas and whatever else. And then you go to the movies and you pay $12.50 to sit down, relax, and go sleep. <laughs> and you're in an air-conditioned building, you know, the movie is on, and you just, nobody's bothering you, so you can just take a nap and you go to sleep. And some of you, you're good with that. I'll pay $12.50 to go to sleep for two hours. I'm fine. Some of you do that in church anyway, so what's the use? But we just feel like that after Christmas and then heading into New Year's Eve. Today, as we look at the, the, what happened after Christmas, we're going to find that there's, there's a life that Jesus wants us to live after Christmas. That there is potential that he's given all of us that he wants us to live out. He wants us to live life big, but in the way that he sees it. He knows how we're supposed to live, and he knows what's best for us. So you can take out your, your notes from your bulletin, and it will help you to follow along with our scriptures. I want to read to us in the book of Luke, chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. I'll read the story to us if you don't have your Bibles. And by the way, just letting you know, we're, we're slowly uh, working on our internet connections and things like that uh, so that we can open it up for our congregation. What was happening in the past is that our wireless service wasn't prepared for you know, a, a vast amount of people, so all of our computers, our internet was slow and was shutting us down when we were uploading our videos to our podcast, so we are upgrading that, and uh, you'll, you'll get more uh, information about that in the future. But in Luke chapter 2, I'm going to read from verse 21, and this is after the birth of Jesus Christ, so it's kind of like this is where we are after Christmas. And when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Now, when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed, and this is talking about Mary, he, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord." And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So in the book of Leviticus, we find that there is a, a, a ceremony or a, a time period in which to present the male child to the Lord at the temple. And this is what Mary and Joseph are doing. And they're preparing Jesus Christ for his future. They actually did what was spiritually required of them so that they could present Jesus in such a way to set up his spiritual future. And that's kind of like what Jesus came to bring on Christmas Day. He came to this earth so that he could set us up for our future spiritually, that we would have eternal life, not just exist on this earth, and then that's it. He's always doing something in our lives to prepare us, and he's always doing something in our hearts and in our spirits to help us become more and more who he sees us to be. 
And then in verse 25, and behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, or the, the act of consoling or comfort, the comfort of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child, speaking of Jesus, is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel for a sign which will be spoken against and for a sign which will be spoken against, yes, a sword will, will pierce your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. So Simeon, being a just man and a devout man, really dedicated to the things of God, was given a word of the Lord saying to him, Simeon, you will not die until you see salvation come to Israel. And this is the day that it, it was fulfilled. And I, I don't know about you, but that's kind of disturbing because it's, it's almost like a... It's a win-lose situation. The win is, A, this day has come. Lose means that I'm supposed to die soon because I will not see death until I see the consolation of Israel, the comfort of Israel, or the salvation that comes to Israel. But Simeon was such a, a just man and devout man that he was willing to pay that price for the future of not just Israel, but all of us included so when he says that, okay, Lord, this is, this is part of who you've made me to be, I'm going to be that person who, when I see that child, I'm going to speak that out. Simeon was willing to die to himself so that others could live. He was willing to encourage Mary and Joseph in who Jesus was becoming. And when he said those words, Mary and Joseph was astonished. They were thinking, what is he saying Mary and Joseph were still growing and, and, and learning about who Jesus was and, and who he was becoming. So when Simeon says these words, they're taking it to heart. And what we learn from this is while you're doing what is spiritually required of you, then God is at work in others to speak into your life. That's what he was doing with Simeon. And then we find, as we continue in verse 36... There was, a, there was one named Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years who did not depart from the temple but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Israel." So Anna is another person that God is using to speak into the lives of Mary and Joseph, that she fasted day and night, and she was of a great age, which means she has so much life experience and wisdom from God that she was able to give that out. And God will always send people your way, that we have people praying over us constantly, like how Anna is fasting and praying for us. In fact, the Bible says that the Spirit intercedes for you and I. In other words, there's not a day that goes by that no one is interceding or praying for you or praying on your behalf. Now, it doesn't mean, okay, someone's praying for me and the Spirit of the living God is praying for me or Jesus is interceding for me and praying for me, so I don't need to pray. No, what the Bible is saying is you're covered by prayer, that you should not fear because you're covered by prayer and at the same time learn from that, that you become a person who is prayerful, not just during food or just before you go to bed, but as the Bible says, never cease praying, that you're constantly praying, that you're communicating with God. And not only when there's traffic or somebody says something bad to you, but that you're constantly in prayer with God. You're talking with him. You're, you're thinking with him. You're pondering on the things of God. You're just constantly connected with God because that's where wisdom will come from. 
And then in thir uh, verse 39, it continues. So when they had performed all these, uh, all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of Passover. And when he was 12 years old, so it's kind of like the chapters just skip through his life from this early first year to now 12 years old. And it's probably because, as the Bible says, if everything was recorded about Jesus, there would not have enough libraries to contain the books that were written about him. So they took the, the most important parts of Jesus' life and penned it for us and wrote it down for us so that we could glean from it, which means everything that the scriptures give to us, which is inspired by God, is that valuable and precious. It's like the best gems out of the best. And this instant or this, uh, this time period is such a critical time for us to learn from at Jesus being 12 years old. So they went to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the days as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph, his mother, uh, Joseph and his mother did not know it. But supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Now so it was that after three days... They found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, now, parents, we can learn from this. Watch, it. Watch how Mary, re Mary responds to Jesus being lost for three days. Imagine, you lost your child for three days. This is what Mary says. Son... Why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. Now, you and I don't respond like that when we lose our child for like two hours. I mean, we, we see them, we're happy that, you know, they're safe, but they get dirty lickings. They get, I mean, we tell them, you're not going to do this, you're not going to do that. Mary says, why have you do this? Why did you do this to us? Your father and I have sought you anxiously. And now here's Jesus' response. At 12 years old, you would think he would give them some kind of attitude. But he said to them, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? I mean, how do you, how do you say, what, what do you say to that person? How, how do you speak that to your child when your child says, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I was amongst the things of God? Like if your child, let's just say your child did not do the chores, and then you go into the room and say, what are you doing? How come you're just reading all day? You're not doing this. Oh, mom, I was in prayer. I was praying for our family finances and our, our family situations and you and dad and your marriage. What if your child said that? I mean, how do you respond to that? That's kind of like what was happening with Jesus. Why were you looking for me? Why are you so upset, mom? I was about my father's business. Jesus called God his father. That was rare. No one referred to him as father or Abba or daddy, but Jesus did. And so now Jesus is growing up, and he's growing up in the ways of God. But they did not understand that statement which he spoke to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. You know, with God, he, he is constantly providing us wisdom. He will not leave us to figure things out on our own. He gives us wisdom beyond our years to reach our full potential. You know, putting away our decorations uh, before was probably one of the most difficult things, or even getting out our decorations. It would be so frustrating because we'd have to go into the attic and, you know, you have to find places to put it and you don't want it to fall through the roof, so you're putting it on the rafters or the beams and you're trying to station it or put it in good places and then it's hot up there and it's dark and you got to turn on the light. But Heidi labeled everything. So it's so much easier now to get the things down, but now we got to take down all the decorations and then put it back up. And now, because it's after Christmas, you wait for that wonderful day 
that you can take down your tree, sweep up all of the needles, dump out that awesome clean water in that thing from the tree holder, and you got to clean up everything and put away all of the lights, and it almost feels like you just want to throw everything away. Instead of putting away everything, little by little, you just want to throw everything away. But you will put away the good decorations. Just don't put away those good disciplines that we've learned during this series and during Christmas. It's not over. This is the after Christmas party, that there's a celebration that continues on because God is an eternal God. Yeah, take down the lights, but don't forget to continue to shine yours. That God still wants to live through us. And even though the excitement of all the presents wear off, don't let his presence wear off. That you stay in the presence of God. So we're going to look at three essential qualities of God that bring out our potential long after we celebrate Christmas. And here's the first thing. That God continually gives me a secured future in Jesus. He gives me a, a future, but a secured one. And continuously. See, when we come to know Jesus Christ, we don't just come to know him and say, okay, everything's going to be fine. My marriage is going to be stronger. My family is going to be healthy. My finances are secured. My job is secured. My health is going to be awesome and everything's going to be top notch. And although it would be great to have everything perfect, we still run into problems or we get hurt. We still have setbacks and regrets. We still have problems in our relationships. But God is continuously giving us security in Jesus Christ. That's why we have after Christmas and not just celebrate Christmas, that he gives us direction. And when Mary and Joseph, while raising Jesus, while they were giving him security as parents, he was in turn giving them security as being the Lord. And they were, they were learning about it. They were, they were growing in it, just like you and I. We grow in this relationship with the Lord. We continuously become knowledgeable and feel that security from God. Even though at times we don't feel it, even though at times we don't see it, God continuously gives us that security in Him. And we can't even imagine what God is making us to be. But that's what Mary and Joseph were learning. They were learning who they were becoming in the Lord as well as who Jesus was becoming. And He was growing up. God gave them a purpose. He gave them direction. In Jeremiah 29, 11, it says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. It's interesting. We worry about things we cannot control. Those are the things we worry about the most. That's probably why we worry, because we can't control it. And that's our future. But God knows our future, and it's a hopeful one. We, we, we receive what God gives to us, and it's a free gift of this hopeful future. That's our part. We can receive from God. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 and 10 says, This is what the scriptures mean when they say, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. But it was to us that God revealed these things by his spirit, for his spirit searches out everything and shows us what? God's deep secrets. Did you know that God has secrets for those who do not know God, for those who do not love God? He has secrets, but for you and I, it's no longer secrets. He has revealed that to those who love God and those who know God. When you love God, he reveals these secrets to you, but if you push him away, it's still secrets. But he reveals this to us. No one can see or hear or imagine what God has prepared for them except for those who love God. That's a, that's, that's a powerful life to live because now God is giving you the secrets that no one else knows. To, lo to those who love God, every single person that loves God, he has given them the security of seeing, hearing, and imagining what he has prepared for you. Every single person knows what a secret is. Remember when we were in elementary and someone says, I have a secret to tell you, but you better not tell anyone. And you tell so many people. And you, tell the, you tell that person the same thing. I have a secret, but don't tell anyone. That person tells that person. Don't, I have a secret. Don't tell anyone. And then the person that told the secret in the first place finds out that they're telling them the secret that they said. And they're like, what? How come you know? It's because everyone is sharing that secret. 
We all love when we have information that no one else has. But we can't contain it because we want to share the information that no one has. Can you see how much power there is in a secret? And God gives us that power. He says, I'm not going to hold back these secrets from you. I'm going to reveal it to you. Every single one of you who love me, I'm going to give you my secrets. And they're called secrets because no one else knows but you. And secrets from God brings us security. Here's the second thing, that God will often send others to speak into my life. He's going to do that. He's going to send people to speak into your life. He will often do that. And sometimes we don't want to receive it. Sometimes it's harsh. And sure, we could present it better, but he is constantly sending people to speak into our lives, just like an Anna or a Simeon, that they spoke into the lives of Mary and Joseph. They spoke prophetically. They told them what was about to take place, that they were forthtelling. They were being encouraging. They were lifting them up. They were letting them know that this is what is taking place in your life. This is what God is doing in your life. That they didn't come with a discouraging spirit and says, you know, you're so bad, you did this, 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 and this. But they spoke into their lives in such a way that they could understand, grasp it, and then walk out life with potential being released out of them. And every one of us, we can sometimes relate to people more than we can to God. So God will send us people. Because for some of us, sometimes we feel like, well, I don't want to... I don't want to draw close to God because I've done certain things wrong. Then God says, okay, then I'm going to send good people into your life because I still love you. And they're going to speak into your life. And sometimes we don't like it. Sometimes they'll say, hey, you know, you got to do better with this. And you can get offended. You can take offense to it, but it might be true. And yes, we can present it better. Yes, probably it could be a, a done better. And, and yes, it, 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 it's going to hurt. But maybe that's what we needed. Maybe there are people in your life that they'll say certain things, and or maybe it's a parent, maybe it's a child or a, a spouse or, or maybe a friend that they'll come up to you and say, hey, man, you, you got to do this better. Or, you know, yesterday when you were saying this, you know, that was kind of harsh. Well, it wasn't harsh. No, it was kind of harsh. I mean, everyone felt it. Well, then that's not me. Too bad. That's not me. It's all you guys. All, you guys are all wrong. No, it's not about right or wrong. It's about, you know, this, just the attitude that you had and just the, 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 the character qualities that you're, you're, you're possessing right now. It's, it's not you anymore. Like, you're different. Well, I'm not different. No, everybody else is different. Everybody changed. You guys are getting old. You guys just kind of handle. You guys kind of handle, you know. You know, you kind of handle my perfection. So everybody else is wrong. And, and then you go back and forth, back and forth. They say, hey, enough already. Enough already. Okay, done. Okay, we're done. You good? You good? Okay, we're done. Okay, stop talking. Yeah, you stop talking too. I was done to stop talking, but you brought it up again. I didn't bring it up. Okay, done already. Enough. Okay. Why you always have to have the last word? I don't have to have the last word. You can have the last word. Okay, right. And it's like never ending. And God is saying, no, I'm trying to bring people into your life for good, to help you because I see potential in your life. It's not just a Christmas thing or Jesus coming into this world, but it's him constantly bringing out of us what he sees in us, the potential that he built inside of us. Paul the Apostle was probably a master at this because Paul the Apostle lived a life of a Pharisee or he knew all the things of God, but he missed the heart of God. By the time he came into a relationship with Jesus, he now understood the spirit of Jesus. So Paul could speak to others with that kind of heart of wanting to do better. And he knew what kind of heart not to have. In fact, one of the disciples, Peter, named Peter, he was playing, uh, being a hypocrite at this one moment. And so Paul had to correct Peter. Because Paul could see where Peter's heart was at. Because that's where Paul came from. And he was able to speak into Peter's life in such a way that would, would help Peter get better. And for some of us, maybe you've come through a season that you, you can help other people, but you just don't know how to. Maybe you're, you're afraid to confront someone, and maybe you just don't know how to do it, and, and so you send them an email or a text message, and, and it doesn't work out well. It, doesn't, it, it, it becomes worse. But you want to do better, and you want to help that person do better. Here's what Paul did. Because Paul understood what happened, to, what happened to the heart because that's where he came from. So he goes to Peter 
and corrects Peter. And this is how he did it in Galatians 2.11. But when Peter came to Antioch, Paul says, I had to oppose him to his face. For what he did was very wrong. Now, they didn't have text messaging back then or emails, but they did have a writing material. Paul didn't write a letter to Peter. He had a relationship with Peter, and he corrected him to his face. That is probably one of the most difficult things that you and I will battle with. It's correcting face to face. Now, we have email and text messaging, but it can go bad. You can say, hey, buddy, I was just wondering how you're doing today. Yesterday, you seemed a little frazzled. And they'll get it. Bling. Hey, buddy, I was just wondering how you're doing today because yesterday, you seemed frazzled. It was frazzled. It wasn't frazzled. You were frazzled. Hey, oh, I got it. Oh, I wasn't frazzled. You were frazzled. Oh, <laughs> this is so funny. Yeah, just checking up because uh, you were alone yesterday, and I just was making sure you didn't do anything bad. Bling. Oh, you were alone yesterday, just making sure you didn't do anything bad. You want to do anything bad? You think I'm doing something bad? What about you? You should look in the mirror. Bling. Bling. What about me doing something bad? Oh, you should look in the mirror. Oh, that's so sweet. He's such a funny guy. You're such a funny guy. What? It can go bad. Some of you have probably done that with emails, and you're like, that's not my intention. I didn't mean to sound like that. That wasn't my intention. You know what Paul did? He spoke to Peter face to face. Because face to face, you'll see the heart behind it. You'll hear the tone of voice. Paul did it face to face. He did it in a way that allowed Peter to get better. God will often send people your way to speak into your life. The question is, will you receive it? I have people that speak into my life. I need people to speak into my life. And if they don't speak into my life, then who's going to correct me? Who's going to help? The Bible tells us in Proverbs 27, verse 6, that wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. It's like a friend would say, hey, God, you know, there's, a, there's a, a wood, a piece of wood in your back. It's kind of stabbing. It's like this, this uh, uh, infection that's going on in your back, and you can't see it. Can I just take it out? No, no, don't touch it. It hurts. Yeah, but th there's something that you cannot see, so I want to take it out because it's, it's like ruining your life right now. It's poisoning in your blood. Yeah, yeah, that's just how I am. Yeah, that's just how I am. Well, let me just take it out real quick. No, 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 don't touch. I don't, I don't want to hear about it. You know, if you were my friend then you wouldn't act like this. No, I'm your friend. That's why I'm saying these things. You got to take that thing out. And as much as that friend would grumble with you, you know what a true friend would do? You'd knock him out, just thinking, you know, thinking hypothetically uh, and illustratively. Knock him out. When they're out cold, unconscious, they would take out that which is causing the infection, bandage them up, and then when they come to, they'll understand. Because they feel a lot different, they feel better because that wound is now being taken care of. A, an enemy would see that in your back with infection and how horrible you're doing. They'll come up to you, oh, how are you doing? Oh, you're looking so good. Oh, hey, looking great, man. Oh, having a good new year? Yeah, good, good. Knowing that you're having a, having a horrible life, you're not doing well, they could care less about you. You could have poisoning in your blood and you're not doing well and infected. And they'll say, you're looking good, man. Hey, you're lifting, eh? You're lifting. Hey, right on. But you're dying on the inside. But a friend will catch those wounds and will speak it. And the question is, am I going to receive it? Am I gonna, uh, will I allow someone to speak into my life in such a way that may hurt, but it will be healthy for my soul? If you don't have someone like that, ask God. Ask God to speak into your life. Ask God to send people your way who love God and who love you that can speak into your life so that you get better. Now, it may seem harsh, but it's not always sharp. It's not always that difficult. Sometimes it's not as piercing. Proverbs 16, 24 says, Kind words are like honey, sweet to the soul and healthy to the body. We can actually help people by speaking kindly to them by speaking good words to them, by speaking like how you speak to other people that you don't even know. Sometimes we speak kind to strangers than our very own family members. 
we speak better to other people's children than our very own. And the Bible says these kind words, they're like honey. It's sweet to the soul and healthy for the body. People are always praying for you and encouraging you. We as a staff pray for you. I as a pastor pray for you. Our prayer team prays for you. And we're always looking forward to God's very best. We pray that God would do what he does best in your life so that we all can become who he made us to be. But here's the last thing, number three, that God will provide all the wisdom I need for my life. He's going to provide all the wisdom. Yeah, but I, go, I went to school. I have this education. I, I've done this. I've lived a long life. I have many experiences. And that's great. But experience alone will not be adequate enough for us to live a life of greatness. It takes more than just experience to live this life of greatness. God will provide all the wisdom we need for our lives. Now, I love going to the movies. Some of you like going to the movies, but I I hate the front row. Not too many of us will sit in the front row. We just don't like the front row because the screen is super huge. So if you sit in the front row, you can't really watch it and enjoy it. But if you come late and that's the only seats available, either you will stand up or you're going to sit in the front row. But experience tells you, don't go to the movies late. Some of you live with people who are always late. And so even the movies, you're like, we got to hurry up. We got to get a good seat because experience told you that when you go to the movies late, you don't get your seat. And for some reason, we think... It's our seat. That when we walk into the movies, we want the bar so we can put our feet up. And we're like, man, they took our seat. Or, oh, man, they're in my seat, the middle. Like me, I love sitting in the middle, kind of halfway up in the middle, kind of eye level, straight on, symmetrical, so that I don't have to turn my head too much. I save energy that way. If I sit too much on the right, then I got to watch this way and I got to move. You see, it just doesn't work. This, you have less of a degree when your head turns. See that? Look, I watched the whole movie. Some of you guys are in the third row like this, trying to watch the whole movie. You get sick. Some of you love the middle. Some of you love the farther back that you go. The teenagers love the back for some reason. (laughs) Alaka. And some of you, you like the end because you got to go shishi all the time. So you just sit on the end because you got to go to the restroom. Yes, I did say shishi in church. Or you want to get snacks and you just constantly get snacks. Or you got to get up every once in a while to move around. Or you got to take your pills. Whatever it is. We all have a favorite seat just like in church. And we come to church. Somebody took my seat. We, so we say, got to come early. Got to come early. And even right before church, everybody's scrapping because you don't want to lose your seat. We don't like sit over there, cold over there. We like sit in this section because it's warmer, it's better. But over here, too loud. But over here, you get better vision. But over here, I cannot see nothing. So you you have a particular place that you want to uh, sit. Wisdom tells you or experience tells you to do things different so that you have different results. But even that is not enough. You could have all of that experience, but if you don't apply it, then what good is it? God gives us wisdom far beyond our life experience through this word right here, the word of God. That the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's what Jesus came to bring. So when we read these words, it comes to life when we apply it, not when we read it. We have to practice it. We have to do something with it. That's why we always talk about doing your devotions, reading the Bible. That when you read the word of God, something happens on the inside. Changes begin to happen. And wisdom is being given so that we can live the life God promised for us. One day, Heidi and I were talking about mixed martial arts. And she said, what is that, um, what is that MMA fighter that uh, he, he has it's like a weird last name. It's like Italian. I'm like, Italian? I don't know any Italian. Closest I know is George St. Pierre, but that's not Italian. I don't know. She goes, yeah, he always wears this neck brace and, I mean, a neck brace, this leg brace. (laughs) Maybe he had a neck brace after the fight. He says he has a leg brace and he he always does like submission holds and and things like that. He's really good at that. I said, what weight division? Heavyweight, lightweight? She goes, I don't know. I think it's heavyweight. And I'm thinking, I don't know. So I'm naming as much fighters as I know, as much MMA fighters that I know. And, And she goes, no, not that one, not that one, not that one. And I'm thinking, I don't know. 
The next day, I'm doing my devotions. I read this scripture that Jesus calmed the storm. And that word calm, starting with the letter C, I thought, wait a minute. I got it. I know this person. Because the only name I could give Heidi was Iceman. And she says, well, who is that? And I couldn't get the first and last name. But because of that C, I came into the house the next day, and I said, Heidi, Chuck, the Iceman Little. And she goes, no, that's not the guy. I was like, what? I felt it in my spirit, in my soul. And I said, I don't know anybody else. There's only like Frank Mir. She goes, that's the guy, Frank Mir. I said, Frank Mir? Yeah, he does a lot of submissions. She goes, that's the guy. And I thought, see, devotions do give you wisdom. It does help in your marriage. And devotions will do that. And yeah, take it, it's a situation like that. But God gives us wisdom that we would never have unless we get into the Word of God. That He'll give it to us to become a better father or a mother or a parent or a person or with our business, to have good business sense. The Word of God gives that to us. Life experience is not enough for us to live a life of greatness. We need to get into the Word of God because He will constantly give us wisdom for our life. He brings life to a lifeless soul, hope for a hopeless person, and restoration for a life that is tarnished. As he says in James 1.5, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. He's going to give it to us generously. Some of us have experienced pain and hurt in our past, but just because we've experienced pain or hurt or a setback or, or some type of difficulty doesn't mean we have enough wisdom for the rest of our life. It just means we have experienced something and, and we're only wiser when we change and apply something different that will help us through our hurts or maybe even avoid hurts or regrets or pain and, and suffering in our lives. That's the wisdom that comes from God. Proverbs 24, 14 says, In the same way, wisdom is sweet to your soul. If you find it, you will have a bright future and your hopes will not be cut short. We can only have a small amount of wisdom through education and through life experience, but God gives us wisdom in such a way that there are no limitations because we can only learn in this world as much as someone else knows or as much as we can learn through life experience. But God gives us wisdom, infinite wisdom, that he has, the deep secrets that he has. I want us to read this last scripture together in Proverbs 9.10. Let's read this together. Ready? Go. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. You see, we don't understand everything right now. But the wisdom of God, when we, when we have the wisdom of God, it's a result of our fear of God. And then when we get to know the Holy One, we begin to understand. We begin to understand the things of God and why he does certain things, why he brought Jesus into this world and, and why Jesus had to live the way he did and then die for our sins. Now we are understanding the secrets of God and, and when we become knowledgeable of the things of God, it's at that point where we gain understanding. That, okay, that's why I'm, I, I, I'm in this situation. That's why he wants to change me. That's why he wants to bring health to my life and hope to my future. I understand now because of who God is. The book of Revelation, it's not in your notes, but it says how blessed is the person. And you'll be a blessed person because you were invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb of God. It's a party in heaven that God wants us to be a part of the after Christmas party, that it's not just about the birth of the Savior, but living this life with the Savior every day of our lives. And I pray that today was kind of like a, a reminder for all of us that God is continuously at work in us. It's not just during Christmas. We're reminded on that day. But today is the day that the Lord has made. He says, rejoice and be glad in it. And we can do that because we know the plans that God has for us. And he has thoughts that he thinks towards us. They're for good and not for evil, to give us a future and a hope. Would you say amen to that? Would you pray with me? Let's, let's bow our heads for a moment as we conclude this morning.
Lord, thank you for giving us wisdom beyond our years. Thank you for sending people our way that will pray for us or, or, or speak into our lives. And if we don't have someone that is speaking into our lives right now, Lord, we ask that you would send someone our way. Or if there is someone in our lives that we would like to speak into our lives, that we would just have that open conversation face to face. And if there are things in our lives or people in our lives that we need to settle things and get things straight with, let's do that face to face, Lord. Give us the, the words to speak, the heart in which to share it, and the spirit to empower us so that when we do speak with this person or people, that they will catch the heart behind it. And it's not about us trying to find fault in each other, but we're trying to make each other better. Someone has to do it, Lord. The world is going backwards. We are people of a movement of God that move forward. So help us to do that today, Lord. Thank you for the gift in Jesus Christ that keeps on giving. We want to be a part of the life in Jesus Christ. That way, we continuously have this hope as we continue to seek the Savior. So we thank you for all of these things. In Jesus' name we pray. And we all said, amen. amen.